Hey everybody, Hoosier Jedi here with another review for you, this time talking episode 9 to season 6 of Arrow, Irrecons <laughs> Irreconcilable Differences. Uh, all in all, I thought this was a pretty solid episode of the show, I just felt it was a little bit predictable. <clears throat> So let's just kind of uh, get right into things. Uh, the wedding scene was definitely fun, and it's kind of a nice counterpart to what we saw on The Flash, where uh, we were once again that reminded that, uh, that where we saw that uh, Iris was uh, not terribly happy with Felicity um, sort of honing in on the wedding there. But here we kind of get to see a, a more proper wedding reception, cute moments, you know, Curtis catching the... Uh, <clears throat> The bouquet, uh, you know, a really nice speech from Renee. Uh, Felicity's dad, who is still technically a wanted fugitive. Um, kind of interesting that he shows up at the wedding reception and no one seems to have any particular issue with this. You know, never mind that there's all these federal agents nosing around Oliver who don't seem to notice that the calculator just strolled into this event. But yeah, okay, Let, let's just kind of let that go. Uh, Renee's speech, which was really nice, and uh, Curtis's speech, which was not so nice. Uh, but it really did do a nice job of just highlighting, uh, you know, where Curtis is emotionally this episode. And he's not in a good place. He's really bummed out about being divorced. Uh, you know, the company is kind of a bright spot for him, but he really is a very lonely person who, yeah, and, you know, it, I mean, weddings are tough on people who are divorced. There's no doubt about that. It's sort of like how Valentine's Day can be tough on people who are single or who have been through a breakup recently. So his, Curtis's situation here feels very, very human. And I definitely loved the bit with uh, Quentin giving Oliver that watch. I mean, and it's not unreasonable. I mean, Laurel is dead, and Sarah really, really doesn't seem like the marrying type. So him giving that to Oliver is very heartfelt and very genuine. Uh, I like how he says, you sort of, a situation like this, you kind of feels right that you have a parent here. But if you really stop and think about where Quentin was in relation to Oliver back in season one, I mean, this really shows an enormous change in just how much the dynamic between these two has shifted. Uh, Quentin in season one was basically like, I, I, I'm just looking for an excuse to throw Oliver in jail. And now here we are. Um, let's see. So the real two big things this episode are what's going on with uh, Caden James and his little uh, posse. Yeah, the uh, Legion of Doom light. Uh, part of me really wants to call them the Secret Society of Supervillains. You know what, just for fun, let's call them that. Um, anyway, so just for fun, let's call them the Society. Uh, Vigilante, Caden James, Black Siren, Richard Dragon, and um, Anatoly. So, I mean, you've got Caden, who, you know, He's very personal kind of connection to Oliver. We still don't get any more details on like what's up with his son, but in a lot of ways, he's very much uh, you know Felicity's counterpart in all of this in a funny sort of way. Uh, Richard Dragon, Ricardo Diaz. I mean, he's the one who really has more of a connection to Diggle. Uh, Vigilante, of course, has those con that connection to Black Canary but his combat style is a lot more like uh, Wild Dog. Black Siren, of course, kind of there as a counterpart, you know, a connection to Quentin, a connection to Oliver, and of course, you know, and a connection to Dinah. And, um, <clears throat> who am I forgetting? Oh, Anatoly. Um, of course, he has that connection to Oliver. And don't forget, his counterpart in the comics is KG Beast. So, and I guess you can sort of see Caden James is also, just through his hacking skills, uh, a kind of a connection to Curtis as well. So you have, in a way, this sort of reverse Team Arrow. Not, I mean, it's not 100%, like um, something like the Crime Syndicate, 
often is, but still, uh, uh, you know, an evil version of Team Arrow in a lot of ways. It's it's quite interesting. Um, I really do wish this group had a proper name. Calling them the Society is fun, but it doesn't really quite work. Um, now, we do get to see some more human sides of both Vigilante and uh, Black Sire in this episode. And I was honestly a little disappointed that they had kind of that uh, moment where Black Siren let Quentin go, simply because it was so predictable. But in all fairness, having Black Siren have no humanity and just sort of revel in just killing anybody she can just because she can, well, that seems like something like a character like the Joker should do. And if I give the show more credit than that. So I'm not entirely surprised that they're giving her this humanity, this sort of more um, human side. I just wish they hadn't done it in a way that's so utterly predictable. <clears throat> I mean, besides Quentin, you know, besides that connection she has with her father, what does Black Siren care about? You know, what was her relationship with the Sarah of her Earth? What about, you know, how would she react if he were to meet her mom? I mean, granted, that's her mother, but, uh, you know, she's not a character we see as much. <sighs> Um, we do know that she was really messed up by the death of the Oliver Queen on her Earth. Um, and we do see her sort of seem to have show a little bit of kindness, a little bit of fondness towards Theo by referring to her as, as Speedy. I mean, she even seems to stroke her hair for a moment. And this doesn't seem to be a mocking sort of thing because Thea's unconscious in that situation. So if she... If Laurel of Earth 2 genuinely cared about Oliver of Earth 2, it's not unreasonable to think that, you know, being Oliver's sister and someone whom Oliver cared about extremely deeply, that, you know, Laurel of Earth 2 would have also cared about the Thea of Earth 2. Um, <clears throat> oh, and I, I do like that bit at the wedding where uh, William is allowed to have a sip of champagne, and uh, apparently this is a little tradition. Uh, in the Queen family that kids can have a sip of champagne at a wedding. Uh, in fact, that reminds me of, uh, that's basically the exact situation uh, that I had alcohol for the first time. I was 13, I was at some wedding, and uh, my, oh, I can't remember, I think it was my aunt or my grandmother told me, yeah, it's okay for you to have a sip of this champagne. And I'm like, oh, hey, champagne, okay, let's try this. I'm like, Oh, yuck! This tastes horrible! Uh, which uh, probably uh, wasn't exactly a reflection on uh, the quality of the champagne, though it might have been for all I know. Uh, but that was my first clue in life that, uh, and that something to that persists to this day is that I really, really don't like the taste of alcohol. Um, anyway. So, finding out what the fate of Quentin on Earth 2, I mean, again, kind of predictable, but it was the, really the acting between uh, Paul Blackthorne and Katie Cassidy that really made that scene stand out. Um, also, you know, some nice moments between Dinah and Vigilante, um, and it's kind of interesting, her sort of saying to him uh, after she leaves the team, I uh, yeah, like, you're basically the only person that I can talk to. I mean, it sort of reminds me a little bit of the comedian and Moloch in Watchmen. No, live-action Watchmen show on HBO. I'm still trying to wrap my head around that. Uh, so getting into the whole uh, traitor thing. Well, it turning out to be Renee, this, I think, was a real no-brainer. No way it's Felicity. I mean, she just had married Oliver. That makes absolutely no sense at all. No way it's Diggle. Um, you know, his wife is the head of Argus. There's no way that he's going to be intimidated by the FBI. And, you know, if push comes to shove, uh, Lila can basically use her old connections doubtlessly to make the FBI back off or to kind of just make sure, get rid of any of that. I mean, seriously, the FBI is no threat to Diggle. <laughs> Um, now, it did briefly dance through my mind that, you know, maybe it's Roy, if, but again, if they had Roy, they, like, they think that Roy was the original Green Arrow, 
and that he, before his death, quote unquote death, put Oliver up to taking up, taking over for him. Well, again, if Roy was in federal custody, um, things just, don't, I just can't see them playing out that way. So the, the, whoever the traitor is, it has to be one of the new people and it has to be somebody with something to lose. Okay, well, we've seen. Dinah basically has nothing. She doesn't really seem to have any friends. Um, she doesn't seem to have any life outside of her job as a cop and being this vigilante. Curtis, same thing. Who has something to lose? Well, it's obviously Renee. He's got Zoe. And um, <clears throat> I do like how um, when kind of the team was confronted about the whole situation, R Renee fessed up pretty quickly. Uh, but, you know, they were totally right to point out, it's like, man, you should have talked to us before you did this. I mean, yes, his motivation is understandable, but still, I mean, Team Arrow's come through worse stuff than this. On the other hand, uh, when this is all said and done, the team is right to be mad at Oliver. It, I mean, he and the others did violate their privacy, and, you know, it is understandable that they might feel a little resentful that it's like he never even seems to have considered Felicity and Diggle as suspects. But again, the logic of why it could be them, it's pretty hard to beat, especially when, okay, Oliver suspects the traitor is one of the new people. The traitor is one of the new people. So I can understand them being unhappy, especially given the precedent of Evelyn betraying the team. But still, um, it just doesn't quite hold up logically. But then again, this is a very emotional situation. And I do like that Oliver was pretty understanding originally with Renee. I mean, it's a case of, wow, Renee, you screwed up bad, but we're going to give you another chance because we, you're our friend and we care about you. And then Renee screws up again. And when Oliver confronts him at the end, Renee even flat out says, yeah, I'm not always going to obey your orders. That's not who I am. And Oliver says, like, well, you know, if that's how it is, you can't be here. Get out. And, I mean, that was the absolute right call. So, yeah, they do have some reasons to be upset with Oliver. But on the other hand, uh, the, the situation does sort of call for exactly the steps that Oliver took. And Felicity says, what they did, they tracked your GPS. And, oh yeah, never mind that Dinah was hiding the fact that she knew who Vigilante was this whole time. The only person she had told is Dig. So, you know, um, Dinah, Dinah, that's a pretty important piece of information that you deliberately withheld from the team. So, you know, maybe you shouldn't kind of talk so much about, you know, doing stuff, people doing stuff behind your back when you were doing stuff behind their back. Um, anyway, I, uh, I don't have a huge amount uh, more to say about this. I am kind of intrigued to see where all of this is going to go. I mean, like, who was Caden James' son? Uh, what exactly is this group's ultimate goal? I mean, why is everybody so down with, let's blow the city up because we're pissed off at Green Arrow? I mean, the obvious answer is Green Arrow cares about Star City. Let's blow up Star City to hurt Green Arrow. But still, I mean... You guys can't come up with something better than that. I mean, sure, they're comic book supervillains, and that's and blow up the city is kind of uh, one of the choice go-to ideas. But still, I mean, there, there's got to be something better that they can throw at us than this. Uh, anyway, guys, I'm going to call it here. Uh, as always, comment, rate, and subscribe. Of course, you can follow me on Twitter at Hoosier Jedi, and please also join me on Tumblr at Jedi Reviewer. Until next time, take care and have a good one.